Okay, good morning and happy Sabbath again. Sabbath. Sabbath. Uh, just for the people who will be watching this, uh, if you would like to get the, or have the quote sheet and the study guide that we're working with, uh, they are available on my website, which is www.preparingtostand.com. Dot org. That's like all one word, all lowercase, the preparing to stand part. And then go to the studies menu and uh, look for the get ready, get ready, get ready series. Uh, trust the rest of you have that study guide and able to follow along. Uh, let's turn to John 14, verse 26. Oh yeah, this is study number four, right. John 14, verse 26. And what's the promise there? Holy Spirit will teach us and remind us. Holy Spirit will teach us what? All things. All things. Okay, I found that to be literally true in my experience. Holy Spirit will teach us all things. How many of you want to be taught by the Holy Spirit this morning? Okay, and last night we looked at Review and Herald, March 22, 1887. A quote there, if we want the Holy Spirit to come and teach us, what's our responsibility? To clear the way. And how do we clear the way? Removing any hindrance. Anything that might be standing between us and God, to be willing to set that aside. Okay, so let's claim this promise now and pray. Father, thank you so much that you haven't left us to our own understanding, that you promised to send your Spirit to teach us all things. May we be willing to keep the way clear between you and us and set aside anything that might be standing between you and us as we get into this study this morning so, we can, so you can have free access to our hearts and minds and we can recognize your voice speaking to us through your word. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. In Testimonies to the Church, Volume 2, there is a section entitled, An Impressive Dream. Uh, you don't have the whole thing in your quotes. I would def you have uh, just the fifth paragraph there, which we're going to look at in just a minute. But I'm going to go ahead and read the first part of the dream to you. Uh, again, this is Testimonies of Church, Volume 2, page 594 through 597. And I'm just going to go ahead and read the first, paragraph, first four paragraphs, and then uh, we'll look at the fifth paragraph together. It says, Well, in Battle Creek in August 1868, I dreamed of being with a large body of people. A portion of this assembly started out to journey. We had heavily loaded wagons. <coughs> as we journeyed the road seemed to ascend on one side of this road was a deep precipice on the other was a high smooth white wall like the hard finish upon plastered rooms as we journeyed on the road grew narrower and steeper in some places it seemed so very narrow we concluded we could no longer travel with the loaded wagons we then loosed them from the horses, took a portion of the luggage from the wagons and placed it on the horses and journeyed on on horseback. As we progressed, the path still continued to grow narrow. We were obliged to press close to the wall to save ourselves from falling off the narrow road down the steep precipice. As we did this, the luggage on the horses pressed against the wall and caused us to sway towards the precipice. <coughs> We feared that we should fall and be dashed in pieces on the rocks. We then cut the luggage from the horses, and it fell over the precipice. 
We continued on on horseback, greatly fearing as we came to the narrower places in the road that we should lose our balance and fall. At such times a hand seemed to take the bridle and guide us over the perilous way. As the path grew more narrow, we decided we could no longer go with safety on horseback, and we left the horses and went on in foot in single file, one following in the footsteps of another. At this point, small cords were let down from the top of the pure white wall. These we eagerly grasped to aid us in keeping our balance upon the path. As we traveled, the cord moved along with us. The path finally became so narrow that we concluded we could travel more safely without our shoes, so we slipped them from our feet and went on some distance without them. Soon it was decided we could travel more safely without our stockings. These were removed and we journeyed on with bare feet. Uh, turn to quotation number 26. Okay, in your quotation seats. Okay, this is the next paragraph in the story we were just reading. And this story's been very formative in my ministry. I'll tell you why a little bit more. As we look at this fifth paragraph. So Testimonies of Church, Volume 2, page 595, says, We then thought of those who had not done what? Accustomed themselves to what? Privations and hardships. What's the word privations mean? We don't use that word a whole lot anymore. Uh -huh, doing without. Okay, those who had not accustomed themselves to hardships and privations. Where were such now? They were not in the company. Okay, at every, this is a key sentence here. At every change, some were left behind. So underline that part. At every change, some were left behind. And those only remained who had accustomed themselves to endure hardship. The privations of the way only made these more eager to press on to the end. So, this group of people going up this path represents the Advent, Advent movement. Okay? At the end of the story, they swung across on these cords to a field of green grass representing heaven. But as they're journeying up the path, they're having to leave stuff behind. And the interesting thing is everybody that started out on the journey didn't make it all the way to the end. Only those who had accustomed themselves to endure hardship and privation. At every change, some were left behind. Hope you grasp the full significance of that. When they had to leave the wagons behind, there were people that turned back. Said, no, I can't do this. Okay, when they had to leave, let the luggage go from the horses, there were people that stayed back. When, there was, when they had to leave the horses behind, there were those who stayed back. When they took off their shoes, there were some who stayed behind. And finally, when they took off their socks even, as far up the path as they were, there were still those who turned around. At every change, some were left behind. And so with that in mind, think about who are going to be the most miserable people at the second coming. You know, the wicked are going to be miserable because they've missed out. But I think the most miserable people are going to be those who made it almost to the end of the path. But then they turned around and went back. They were so close. They'd only kept going a little longer. And I was thinking about this one day, and it's like the Holy Spirit said, what do you want to accomplish in your ministry, Jim? I'm like, I want to get people all the way to the end of the path. I don't want to just help them out a little bit here along the, there along the way. 
I mean, sometimes, you know, you meet somebody and that's all you can do, is just help them out a little bit. That's fine. But, I mean, what is the goal for your ministry? You want to get people all the way to the end. I don't want people to turn around at some point. And then I found this, this uh, quote number 28 here. It's from This Day with God, page 152. And there's actually several other quotes like this one. Excuse me, quote number 27. Some, yeah, I got ahead of myself a little bit there. It's quote number 27, From Councils to Writers and Editors, page 68. And there's actually several quotes like this that I've ran across. This is the one that's worded best for what we're talking about this morning here. It says, Our work is to do what? Prepare a people to stand in the great day of God. Okay, that's what our work is. Get people all the way to the end of the path. So that when Jesus comes, they're standing there, ready to meet him. And so I've taken this as my personal mission statement. To prepare a people to stand in the great day of the Lord. I would challenge you to do the same thing. Not just help people out so they can turn around at some point in the path. And so because of that, our ministry has basically four different phases. Okay, there's practical Christianity. Talked about that some last night. End time prophecy studies. So we're going to talk about this morning. And then there's country living, which we'll be doing some practical classes and some studies on that. And we'll learn a survival for our final flight. Okay, all four of these things. Going to need all four of them in order to make it all the way to the end. So, let's go back to the last song we sang. Proverbs 22, verse 3. Okay, wise people foresee trouble coming. Okay, in this dream and in the prophecies we're going to study, we're being warned. What's coming? Wise people foresee trouble coming and avoid it. Okay, take what action they can to avoid the trouble. The ultimate trouble being turning around on the path and not making it to the end. But foolish people just keep going and they end up suffering as a result. Mm -hmm. <laughs> trouble is we can only foresee a certain, a certain you know, short distance, okay? Like you see a ball coming into a group of people and you're like, somebody's going to get hit. And sure enough, somebody gets hit. Okay, but, you know, that's just short term, being able to foresee the future. In Isaiah 46, verses 9 and 10, though, God makes a very interesting claim. He says, basically, like if anybody else can do this, step up, because I'm the only one that can. And he's talking about his ability to see the end from the beginning. And so God can see the end from the beginning. God knows what's going to happen. And the old memory verse in Amos 3, verse 7 says, Surely the Lord God does nothing except he does what? Reveals, Reveals his secrets to his servants, the prophets. And so God has told us what's going to happen in the pro by, through the prophets. And so if we're going to be wise and foresee the future, foresee trouble coming, what do we need to do? We need to study the prophecies, the Bible's prophecies. And so with that in mind, let's look at the next quote. Uh, that's the one from this number 28, This Day with God, page 152. That aims us where? Matthew 24 in particular. So the 24th chapter of Matthew gives us what? an outline of what is to come upon the world. And so for the first part of our study this morning, we're going to look at Matthew 24, we're going to take it verse by verse, and we're going to find out what this outline of end time events is. So let's turn to Matthew 24.
Matthew 24, and look at the first couple verses. Hope you got your Bibles this morning. Going to need them. Okay, what's happening in the first couple verses of Matthew 24? Who? Jesus and his disciples are leaving the temple. Okay, so Jesus and his disciples are leaving the temple. Okay, this is the last time he was at the temple, by the way. Matthew 24 follows Matthew 23, where he just had it out with the Jewish leadership there in the temple. And they're leaving the temple. And what does one of the disciples say? Ah, oh, look at the temple buildings. Okay, this is a very patriotic Jewish thing to do. Okay, this is the only temple to Jehovah God in the whole world, and it's in their capital city, and they're right proud of that. And so, ooing and aahing at the temple, you know, again, very patriotic Jewish thing to do. And so, and it was a magnificent building. Okay, when the Romans came to destroy the city, they wanted to save the temple. Just because it was such a magnificent building. But what does Jesus say? It's all going to come down. Not one stone's going to left upon another. Okay, probably not what the disciples expected him to say. Verse 3, where are they? Mount the Mount of Olives. Okay, has anybody been over there? No, it's a long ways. Yeah. <laughs> okay, anyway, uh, Jerusalem's on a mountain. Uh, Mount Zion, Temple Mount, all that stuff. Okay. And then there's the Kidron Valley. And then Mount of Olives. Mount of Olives is a little bit higher than Jerusalem. Mount of Olives figures into a lot of the stories in the Gospels. Uh, it's where Jesus and his disciples camped when they were in the Jerusalem area. From the top of Mount of Olives, you can look down and see Jerusalem. And the temple compound is going to be a big part of that view. And so picture them hanging out in their camp, and the disciples are like, now's our time to ask him. You know, they've been thinking about what he said this whole trip over. And so they come, and they ask him. Uh, in the last part of verse 3, they actually ask him two questions. They think they're just asking one, but what are these two questions? Uh, when is this going to happen? And what's the second question? What will be the sign of your coming in the end of the age? Okay, in their th Ellen White points out, in their thinking, they thought, well, of course the temple is going to be destroyed when Jesus comes a second time, along with the rest of the world that's going to be destroyed at that point. And so they mix these two events in their thinking and in their questioning. But the temple was destroyed back in A.D. 70. Jesus hasn't come yet. And so they're actually asking about two different events. Now, Ellen White points out that what Jesus says here in response is what we typically would call a parallel prophecy, dealing with both of these events, because there's a lot of parallels between the two of them. And that's fortunate for us because we can look back and see what happened then, get a much better idea of what's going to happen for us in the end times. So let's look at that second question a little more particularly. What are they asking for? Uh, notice that that word is singular. Okay, as Adventists, we talk about signs of the end so much that we sometimes we tend to think that that is plural. It's not. It's singular. 
And so what they're basically asking for is a sign that would let them know when the final end time is going to be. Okay, would you like to have a sign that would let you know that? Yeah, unfortunately for us, they asked, that's what they asked for. Now, earlier in Matthew 7, verse 7, Jesus said, Ask and you will receive. And the disciples had asked, he's going to give them the sign. To be sure we don't miss it, let's think just for a moment here. In order for a sign to be a sign, what does it have to be? And I'm talking about any kind of sign now, not just a prophetic sign. It has to be something you can see. It has to be visible. Okay, and once you see it, what else do you have to be able to do with it? Understand it, yeah. So in order for a sign to be a sign, it has to be something that's visible and something that's understandable. And frequently they put up signs to get us to take some sort of action. Okay, not all, some signs are just information, but as I was sharing this with a group once, the pastor says, well, yeah, but they're expecting us to act on that information that they've given us, so it's still the action. So you can take that any way you want to. Okay, it's got to be visible, got to be understandable, and potentially have action connected with it. Let's give it a couple of illustrations here. Freeway exit signs telling you, turn off here. Okay, billboards telling you to buy this stop sign, stop the action, and so on. So again, sign to be a sign has to be something visible, something understandable, potentially have an action connected with it. Okay, so as we read on here, we're going to look for this sign. And <clears throat> But verses 4 and 5, what's Jesus' concern there? As Jesus starts talking. Yeah, verses 4 and 5. Be careful that you're not deceived. Okay, so the disciples are coming to him like, tell us about end time events. And Jesus says, yes, I promised I'll, you know, you ask and you'll receive. You're going to, we'll, we'll talk about it. But what you really need to worry about is that you're not deceived. You know, that's the main concern on his mind. Now, this talk that Jesus begins here in verse 4 goes all the way through Matthew 24 and all the way through Matthew 25. We call it frequently the Olivet Discourse because it happened on the Mount of Olives. And I would really encourage you to study like these two chapters with that in mind, okay? Jesus, looking at Jesus' concern about his people not being deceived. I want to give you a couple illustrations here. Flip over to verse 37. Verse 37. Who's verse 37 talking about? Noah. Noah. Were the people in Noah's day deceived? Yes. Yeah. What was their deception? <coughs> That it wouldn't rain, that not to board the ark. Okay, so yeah, they had global population there, so a lot of different possibilities, but one thing all of their deceptions had in common, and that's what's significant for our part, is that when the time came to get on the ark, none of them thought it was important to do so. When in reality, it meant everything. Okay, not only did they lose their lives in the flood, but also none of the people that died in the flood will be in heaven. Okay? The ark being the provision for, for salvation that God offered at that point by refusing to get on the ark. They were refusing God's salvation, and so none of them will be in heaven. Had a hand up back there. I was going to say, before they could possibly act on something, they had to have a belief system before that, and they didn't believe that God would actually destroy mankind. No matter how evil they were. Right, right. They didn't yeah. And so, anyway, with that in mind, I just want to throw out the idea, is it possible that here in the end times, because Jesus says the end times are going to be like Noah's time, is it possible that there's something very important that we do, that we're being deceived into thinking it's not important at all? Let's look at another illustration. In the first part of Matthew 25, well, actually, let me back up just one more here. 
this talk that Jesus gave ends with four parables. Uh, the last part of Matthew 24 is the parable of the faithful and unfaithful servant. In the first part of Matthew 25 is the parable of the wise virgin, wise and foolish virgins. Uh, then the parable of the talents. And that chapter ends with the parable of the sheep and the goats. Okay, four parables. Now, I used to look at these parables individually. And they do have good teaching when you look at them individually. However, I felt impressed one day to look at them all together. And they have an awful lot in common. In each of these parables, there's two groups. In each of these parables, there's a master or bridegroom who goes away and then comes back. Both of these groups consider themselves to be servants of the master or bridegroom. And when the master or bridegroom returns, one group is praised and rewarded and enters the kingdom. However, that's symbolized in that parable. The other group is rejected and cast out. Since Jesus' concern here is that we're not deceived, I believe that in these parables, Jesus is giving us tools to be able to look at our own experience and determine whether or not we are deceived. Okay, because these parables expose deceptions that are common in the church in the end times. And just for example here, let's look at the parable of the ten virgins. Okay, it's probably one of the more well-known parables. Okay, the foolish virgins, were they deceived? Yeah, what was their deception? They thought they had enough oil. Okay, like we talked about last night. Eve thought, I've got this. Okay, they thought without the extra oil, they were okay. They thought they had it. But as things turned out, they didn't. Okay, they were expecting to get into the kingdom. But they didn't make it. Okay, another deception that they had. And so let's, you know, I would encourage you to study these parables. Be sure you're not deceived in one of the ways that each of these parables describes. Uh, one final illustration of Jesus' concern about deception here is in the prophetic part of the, the prophetic sequence part of the chapter that we're going to be studying this morning, which goes through verse 31. There's three different warnings about false Christs, false prophets, and deception. This is the first one. Verses 4 and 5 are the first one. If you add up the number of verses in these three, it's almost a third of this prophecy is Jesus' concern and warnings about false Christ, false prophets, and deception. I mean, so this is really heavy on Jesus' heart as he gets into this talk with his disciples. <clears throat> please, you know, please study that further on your own. And kind of in that same way, what we're going to be going through this morning is really a study of studies. So like almost any point that we make, you could make a whole other study on its own on that, or even a series of studies, as in this particular case here. Um, and so we might be raising more questions than we're answering, but I think it's still worth it to go through this um, for to see the sequence of what, what's happening here. Okay, so let's read on. Uh, verses 6, 7, and 8 are the next set of verses. What do we have there? Let's make a list. Okay, wars. What else? Famine. What else? Pestilence. What else? Earthquakes. Okay, we're going to come back and talk about, these are really important verses. We're going to come back and do a whole study on this, on these three verses here. Uh, I think it's going to be like tomorrow night. Um, <clears throat> but are these wars, fam famines, pestilence, and earthquake, is that the sign? How do we know? Notice the last part of verse 6. What's it say? These things are going to happen, but the end is not yet. And then down in verse 8, what else does it say about that? These are just what? The beginning of birth pangs. 
Okay, again, we're going to come back and study these verses. It really hurts me not to study them out now because they're so important. Uh, but we need to devote a, the, whole, the time of a whole study to that. So that brings us down to verses 9 and 10. What's verses 9 and 10 talking about? Okay, persecution. Is persecution possibly the sign? Okay, probably not. There's always been persecution, right? And the way it's spoken of here, it's not like it's a signal event. And, you know, just think Jesus is letting us know that in the end times we can expect persecution also. Which brings us to verse 11, which is the second warning about false Christ, false prophets, and deception. And verses 12 and 13, what do we have there? Okay, he that endures to the end will be saved. It's a very important verse in this whole context. Let's look at verse 12 in particular too though. It says, because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. Okay, I used to look at this verse and think, oh, the people in the world are going to get less loving as we get closer to the end. And I do believe that's going to happen. However, remember the song we sang this morning, 1 John 4, 7 and 8. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God. And he that loves is born of God and knows God. So this is talking about people who love it's talking about people who had a relationship with God. And in order for, for that relationship to grow cold, what must it have been earlier? It had to be warmer. Maybe these people were even on fire. Okay? And so this is a warning to us. Don't let all the crazy stuff happening in the world cause us to let our love, our relationship with God grow cold. That brings us to verse 14. What do we have there? Okay, is the gospel going to the whole world the sign? Because, because it says, and then the end will come, a lot of people think it is. Okay, I've heard leading people in the denomination, I was in the congregation, they were standing there in the pulpit saying that. However, we just noted before, in order for a sign to be a sign, what does it have to be? Visible and understandable and potentially a call to action. Would the gospel going to the whole world be visible and understandable to us? No, it would not. Okay, God can read hearts. He'll know. But we have no way of verifying when that's happened. Okay? Now, don't misunderstand me here. This is a very important verse. Let's us know what our job is in the end times. Let's us know what has to happen before Jesus can come. But I'm just saying it cannot be the sign. Contrary to popular belief kind of thing. Because it would not be either visible or understandable to us. And so we have to read on. Let's look at verse 15 and 16. They're all the same sentence, so we've got to treat them together. What do we have there? Abomination of desolation. Flee to the mountain. Okay, it starts out saying, therefore when you see. So this is something that's visible. And a little later it says, whoever reads, let him understand. So this is something that's understandable. Okay, it might seem like cryptic language. And maybe you've been tempted like I was to just skip over it. Well, I don't know what that means, and so I just keep reading on. Okay, however, Jesus says here, you know, it looks like a uh, Bible writer just kind of threw that in. But Ellen White points out that Jesus, I believe I gave you the quote for that too. <clears throat> Ellen White points out that Jesus himself said, be sure you understand this. 
And this study grew out of me realizing that I needed to understand that. This whole study grew out of that. And studying it out for that. Okay, I've got to understand what this is about. So here we have something that's visible and understandable. And then in verse 16, there's an action connected with it. So quite possibly the abomination of desolation is the sign. If so, the rest of the passage should bear it out. And so we're going to read on right now, but I promise we'll come back and we'll talk about what the abomination of desolation is. In a little more detail. There's a whole lot more to it, but we'll do some. Okay, let's look at verses 17, 18, 19, and 20 together. What are they? What do we have there? Verse 17, 18, 19, and 20. What are these verses all talking about? Okay, I'm looking at these verses as a whole. Yes, you know, be sure that you're ready ahead of time. You know, it's, it's like once the time comes, it's too late to get ready. But looking at them as a whole, they are all instructions for when we flee, basically. Okay, so that's pointing back to the abomination of desolation as the signal to flee. Which brings us to verse 21 that says, For then, when is the then that this is talking about? Okay, do you see the flow of the verses here? Here's verses 15 and 16. It says, When you see the abomination of desolation, flee to the mountains. And then the next four verses have some instructions about when you flee. And then verse 21 says, For then. Okay, what's that? What's the then that this is referring to? Abomination. When you see the abomination of desolation. Okay, and this verse is telling us why to flee. And what's it say there? For then there will be what? Great tribulation such as not been since the beginning of the world until this time, no, nor ever shall be. Sounds real similar to Daniel 12 verse 1 that Jesus pointed us to a minute ago. So, the abomination of desolation is this lets us know that the time of trouble, the great tribulation, or the great time of trouble is about to begin. Mm -hmm. Verse 22. Unless those days were shortened, no flesh would survive. Okay, talking about the time after the abomination of desolation. And then verse 23 through 28 is that third warning about false Christ, false prophets, and deception. Uh, please look at these verses more on your own because uh, they contain some important information. Uh, but for right now, we're going to go ahead and read on. Verse 29, what do we have there? Sun darkened. Okay, let's make a list. Sun's going to be darkened. What else? Uh-huh, moon's not going to give its light. What else? Stars are going to fall. And one more thing. Powers of heaven are going to be shaken. Okay, kind of keep that list in mind. We're going to come back and add to that list in a bit. And then verse 30 and 31. What's there? What's happening in verses 30 and 31? Jesus is coming. Okay, so let's take what we've talked about so far and make the outline in Matthew 24 that we, that the quote talked about. We'll do it in the form of a timeline.
Okay, here's the time of trouble. What marks the beginning of the time of trouble? Abomination, Abomination of desolation. Mm -hmm. I'm going to abbreviate because those are a couple really big words. And when we see the abomination of desolation, what are we supposed to do? Flee. At the end of the abomination of desolation, what is there? Another event. And the, the signs in the sun, moon, and stars. Okay. We're going to come back and talk about that some more too. For right now, I'm just going to call it a cosmic event. Or cosmic happening. And then shortly after that, Jesus comes. Okay, so that makes sense from what we just got through studying in Matthew 24. Now I have to ask a question. Where are we on this timeline? Are we here? Or are we here? It's kind of hard to figure out in a way because we have some uh, scriptures um, from Uriah Smith, all their books that state that the event of the stars falling from the sky already happened. Yeah, and Ellen White verifies that, that. That's probably wrong then. And Ellen White verifies that. So it's not wrong. So that means that we are yeah. in the constant yeah. event and it's coming. It means that we have the time. I forgot to add about the disasters. You know, the <clears throat> wars, famines, diseases, and earthquakes happening here. Okay, the reason we have this question is because Adventism grew out of the Millerite movement. Let's not lose sight of our history. Last night we learned an important lesson from the Millerites. <clears throat> the Millerites studied this same passage of scripture that we did, came to exactly the same conclusions we came to. And for them, they saw a fulfillment of this in the events connected with the 1260 day prophecy. And what's the very next thing? They saw, you know, fulfillment of the cosmic events in certain cosmic happenings in the late 1700s, early 1800s. And what's the very next thing that happens in the prophecy? Jesus, Jesus comes. And that gave emphasis to their belief that Jesus was coming in 1844. Yeah. Mm -hmm. However, Jesus didn't come in 1844. He entered a new phase of his ministry in the heavenly sanctuary. But that whole experience lets us know something else. Remember at the beginning of this study, the disciples mixed the destruction of Jerusalem time with the end times. Okay, the Millerites mixed the 1260-day prophecy with the end times. And so that lets us know that there's not just the two parallels, there's actually three of them. Okay, the destruction of Jerusalem time, the 1260-day time, and the end time. They're all three parallels to this same prophecy. Which is really fortunate for us because, again, we can look back at these two historical events and get a much better idea of what's going to happen to us in the end times. And so, shortly after the Millerite experience... Ellen White started receiving visions and dreams 
And one of the things that she says, look at quotation number 31. This is from early writings, okay? Early writings being the earlier things that she wrote, or the things that she wrote in her early in her experience. So this is something God revealed to her fairly early on. Early writings, page 36. And she says, the time of trouble such as never was has not yet commenced. And so that lets us know where are we? Are we here or are we here? We're here. I'm going to go ahead and erase it anyway. But we understand that we're here facing all of this. And as we look at the rest of the prophecies, we're going to realize we're very close. Any questions or comments? Yes, sir. I'm sorry, where do you say we are? Because are we at the beginning or are we at No, we're here. Well, for, the, for the end time one, as far as the middle parallel, the 1260 year prophecy parallel, we're here in that one. But this is all going to happen again in the end times, because this is a parallel prophecy. Okay, All of this happened in connection with the destruction of Jerusalem, all of this, except for the second coming, all of this happened in connection with the 1260 day prophecy, except for the second coming. All of this is going to happen again in connection with the end times that second coming will be a part of. Jim, yes? How exactly do you see the second parallel? Because they didn't have a fleeing. I'm sorry. In the second parallel, there wasn't a fleeing or a persecution or, um, you know, running to the mountains. Uh, the Waldenses fulfilled all of that. Okay. There was persecution, yeah. Yeah, there was severe persecution. Okay, and the Waldenses fled to the mountains along with several other groups, but I mean the Waldenses are the most, the most well-known one of that. And so all of that was fulfilled as well. I'm sorry, I can barely hear you. No, we're going to come back and talk about that. The, oh, this is abomination of desolation. Okay. And, and we're going to talk about what that means. I wanted you to get the sequence. I wanted to talk about the sequence before we moved on. You know, I just, you know, the sequence is what's important right now. We're going to come back and fill in some blanks and talk about these things more in detail. Yeah, we're not done yet. <laughs> but um, with that... The, the 1260, the, the second parallel, um, Jones went to court and, um, in 1888, A.J. Um, Jones, A.T. Jones, yes, yeah, yes, yeah, so the, it, with the Blair Bill. Right, and the Sunday law could have happened and Jesus could have came. But it didn't. But it didn't. So are you saying that the abomination No. This this hasn't happened yet. But in this in this second parallel, was there an abomination of this? Yes. Basically it's when the papacy received political power. When the deadly wound was healed. Pardon? Are you saying that's when the deadly wound was healed? They they were reinstated to their position. I I didn't hear the first part of the deadly wound. The deadly wound was healed and they were reinstated to their that's that's happening right now, right? The deadly the deadly wound is healing, and the papacy is again going to have political power. We'll see how that happens in a minute. Well, not a minute, maybe a few minutes. But anyway, yeah. Any other questions? Getting some good qu good questions here. Want to address anything else before we go on? Okay, because this study is so involved, it's going to take the rest of the morning, and I promised a break in the middle, and this is a really good place to take a break. So let's take a short break, um, maybe 10 minutes or so, okay, and then we'll come back together and finish up this study, okay? Um, let's go ahead and have prayer. Oh, just before prayer.
Uh, you're welcome to take pictures of this. We're not even done here. Uh, at the end, those of you who have the study guide materials, there is a, uh, a timeline okay, that goes with this. Uh, don't fill this in quite yet because there's uh, the numbers, there's more stuff that we're going to add and you might put things in the, wrong, in the wrong place. So for right now, just let's just look at this. All right, let's pray. Father, thank you for revealing these things through your Son. <laughs> um, and continue to send your Spirit to guide us as we study them this morning. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.